Okay, um, my musical journey began in church. And I recall we were in the Borsalith area of the city of Birmingham. And um, we were worshipping at a school hall um, called Tyndall Street School Hall. And I would have been about five or six. We had musicians in the church. Um, but I recall we had a kind of mini concert at the time. And my best friend at the time, looking back now, he was definitely a child prodigy. And um, his name was Wayne Williams. He still is alive now. And he was playing a six string guitar that was taller than him. Mm -hmm. And we were at the concert and um, his sister was called on to sing and there was just uproar and I couldn't see what was going on. But by the time she had finished singing and they called her back on, I realized that the people that were there, they stood up watching him because they couldn't believe how a seven-year-old young boy could hold his notes and play the song Inch Perfect while his sister sung. And that resonated in me. And I thought, that's very, very interesting. You fast forward, so we're still in church. Fast forward, I was about the age of 12. And we had a drummer in the church, but he was played like marching kind of drumming thing and the old man. And I think he was a bus driver at the time, so he went to work. And... Um, Wayne said to me, just play. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. And he said, so he showed me a little beat. And he said, do you think you could do that? I said, I don't know. This was just before church. So um, he showed me and I did it. And it felt right. There was something about it. And he was saying, do it again. And I did it again. I thought it was fluke. And I did it again. Then he showed me something else and I did it again. Then church started. So I just sat in church. And he said, no, you got to come. <laughs> so I had to go up and play in church right there, right then. And the rest is history. Well, musically, musically, um, I think for most Caribbean parents, their children having uh, the ability to either play an instrument or at least be musical. Uh, was kind of key because when they started their Sunday schools, uh, they only relied on, well, they only had their children to rely on. So my father could play guitar. He taught my brother to play guitar. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, then he'd stand us in front of him and teach us songs. So one of the first songs I remember him teaching us was, um, Were You There? When they crucified my Lord. So all three of us had to sing it. And we had to sing it in harmony. So again, these things you learnt um, instinctively mm. rather than reading music. Definitely. And it wasn't until I was about eight, um, my mother sent myself and, well, just me, I think, to piano lessons. So between the age of eight and 12, I learnt to play the piano. That's where I learnt to read music. But she started... Um, a Sunday school in the area we'd moved into and um, you know all these little Sunday school children we didn't have any members so I at the time was going to one church for Sunday school and then we'll come back and then have Sunday school at my mum's church you know her little Sunday school at the YMCA at 4th Avenue Wolverhampton and um, we'd lead the songs so we were song leaders so if you imagine I would be about maybe eight nine well nine and I was uh, song leading. Mm -hmm. So I'd sing the choruses, they'd teach us the choruses, and then, you know, you'd um, stand up and, and, uh, and sing the choruses as well. Mm -hmm. So in terms of a singing, um, it, it was almost organic. So it was more uh, and the need to mm -hmm. rather than, yeah, too. you know, you had a talent and mm -hmm. a gift being promoted. It mm -hmm. was, we need someone to sing. Mm -hmm. Okay, Monica, you, you know, learned to trade. And that's how, mm -hmm. that's how I started. Mm -hmm. ah. <clears throat> For me, again, yeah. back um, in that small church um, in Tyndall Street at the time, later on became George Street, it was a family, the pastor's family called the Williams family. And as mentioned before, Wayne Williams, absolutely amazing bass player and gifted musician. He could play the drums, he could play the guitar, he could play the bass guitar. He had an older brother called R.C. Williams. He was the maestro. Mm. And this is the guy that could read. And I, I remember one day um, 
seeing him, there were, he, was, he was the choir master and he was also um, the music director and he was teaching the choir a song. So I never heard the song before and he was looking at his, um, this book and he was picking away and I thought, what on earth is he doing? So I went up, a bit <laughs> challenged as I were at the time, <laughs> And I said, good evening, Brother Us. Um, what are you doing? Because I looked down in the book and all I could see was Chinese writing. So I thought, maybe he's learning Mandarin or something like that. I said, what are you doing, Brother Us? He says, I'm learning the song. But I said, I, I, I don't see anything here. He said, oh, so I said, what are those? He said, these are the musical notes. Poor colored fool me. <laughs> so he was the first person that could read music this was talking about 68, 69, something like that, 67. Yeah. He could read the music. So he'd pick it out, get the tune, the melody, then he'd get the choir together and they'd teach, do the, teach yeah. the harmonies, the three, four part harmonies. And um, we were one of the first churches to have a, a proper choir as well, yeah. yes. And we were, from my history, certainly well, the church in what then became George Street, we were the first church ever to have a concert anywhere in the Church of God of Prophecy? Ah, well, I can go back to, uh, as Les was saying, maybe the mid-60s, um, and the place we lived, because, you know, my parents, my father came here in 1952 to, to the UK, and um, I think just maybe just before the Windrush ship, he didn't come on the ship, he came on a ship, but I don't think it was the Windrush, mm. and um, my mother came in 1956, <clears throat> um, that's another story, I won't go into that. But, um, so say mid-60s, mid we were living in somebody else's house. So, you know, folks, it was difficult to buy your own property. Mm -hmm. And my dad didn't have any intention of staying in England. His plan was always to go back to Jamaica, so he wouldn't buy a house. So we were living on Waterloo Road, um, 121 Waterloo Road, and um, one of these three-storey houses, we lived right up in the top in the attic. Um, and there was a barber shop just at the at the end, and they'd always have music playing loudly. And um, the song or song as a, uh, at the time was um, Millie, my boy lollipop, my boy lollipop. So that that sort of you know beat. So we we'd go in the in the alleyway and we'd dance to you know to to the the, the music. And the other influence was the Beatles because they were kind of popular. Because all we'd heard up until that point Chuck Wagon was Chuckwagon Gang, mm. Jim Reeves, four four part harmony, mm -hmm. um, Jim Reeves. So every Sunday morning mm -hmm. on the Blue Spot Ground, yeah. we'd hear Jim Reeves singing. That's right. It was very laid back country, mm -hmm. you know, very slow music. All Elvis Presley, but mm. again, just his Christian stuff. Yeah. So when we heard kind of upbeat, it was mm. kind of quite exciting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sort of very early on. Uh, and then that graduated into the 70s with Andre Crouch Definitely. coming on the scene. Mm. And that was kind of phenomenal for us. Because mm. up until that point, we were, if we had Country. programs, we'd sing out of... The hymn books. Um, hymns of Glorious Praise. Not Hymns of Glorious Praise. Banner Hymn. Banner Hymn. Sacred Sounds and Soul. The Blue Book. So we'd sing the, you know, the songs our parents would sing. Mm -hmm. And to overlay that, we'd even dress like our parents. Mm -hmm. So... We were like 10, 11 and wearing hair net mm. and hats. All right. Because, you know, that's, that's what uh, the parents did. That's, mm. like, you know, what mm. we expected. And you couldn't go to church without a hat. Mm. And then, you know, as we got to teenage years, the hat was getting a bit too much. So we'd crochet little tams and just perch them. You mm. could barely see the tam mm. in, your, in your half row. You know, we'd perch them on the side of our hair. So, so our world was opened up. When um, Andre Crouch, Definitely Crouch came doubt. on the scene, without doubt, particularly for the the younger mm. folks, so people like Andre Crouch and the spin-offs from him, mm. Billy Thetford, Danny Bell Hall, all those kind of people. So um, that was the early stages, and then do I talk? Can I talk about my uh, choir? Yeah, you're gonna come to that in a bit. Okay. okay, I won't. I won't do that. But definitely, but, but yeah, but so 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 the, definitely the secular music played yeah, a part yeah. in influencing sure. my love for music. Mm. And it was the Beatles and um, uh, Millie in the sixties. Then obviously Michael Jackson mm. in the you know in the early seventies. Sure. Michael Jackson, the Osmonds, mm. Mm. but you know, but mm. but the Jackson Five were definitely it for us. The, right. the early seventies.
Yeah. Trevor and Glenn, um, I've known them all my life. Not recall mm. ever meeting them. As far as I was concerned, they were my brothers. Mm. I had a brother who was living in Jamaica at the time and um, um, never met him till he came to England when he was about 14. I would have been about nine. Mm. So um, Trevor and Glenn Prince were my brothers. Mm. Um, I remember being at school one day, just started um, Tyndall Street Junior School. And this little boy came up to me and he said, you got brother? I said, no, I've got no brother. He started fighting me. <laughs> and he stopped. So when I caught out what was going on, we just started chasing him. I chased him, I chased him. I wanted to give him what for. <laughs> but I couldn't because he stood between his two brothers. Yeah. And when I look up, there was like two tree chunk. <laughs> and so I was mad. And yeah. I was crying. Mm. So I walked away and I saw Glenn. So Glenn came to me and said, what you crying for? What you crying for? I said, I'm the way I did. I'm about to be about my brother and all these kind of things before. No, you stop fighting. He said, stop it. And he said, if them ever ask, it was a trick at the time. That's what they used to do. If you had no family, they'd, yeah, they'd fight, fight you. Yeah, yeah. So he said, tell them. Is it a white boy or a black boy? White boy. Okay. So okay. he said, um, tell them, say, yeah, brother here, Trevor and Glenn. I'm from that. So my mom used to babysit them. Um, when they were young boys, so as far as I was concerned, Trevor and Glenn Maybe were brothers. my brothers. Yeah. So I was fortunate to have two musical influences, one from the Williams family, from my local church, and then um, Trevor and Glenn later on. So what was unique about our church, um, the church we were going to, we call it George Street now, it was Tyndall Street then, we were one of the first churches to have a full band because most churches, they only had like a guitarist mm. or they may have a piano player or something like that. But we had bass, drum and rhythm guitar mm. as far back as I can remember, definitely. So we were very blessed. So when people came and saw us, they said, is it like convention every night at your church? Because mm. they weren't used to that. And when you think about um, racism and the windwash thing, I kind of thank God for that as well, because it ties up because our parents couldn't go. Some of them, they weren't all Pentecostal mm. when they came to England. Mm. From back home, there were Methodists and all these kings. And that mm. could see the scriptures. You came to your home and your home received you not. So a lot of them couldn't um, mm, worship. worship in the what they call the nominal churches at the time. So they had to find school halls. So obviously you couldn't have pianos in school halls mm. because they didn't have them. So that gave rise to portable instruments. So if you look at all the black churches, that's where it really started out because you plugged your guitar in your little amp and it went your way. Yeah. So that's yeah. where it really came from. Mm. So you didn't have the big organs like you did in, in you know, the Methodist the, church. Yes, so yeah. they had to make do and that's how it happened. You packed it down, you packed the chairs away and you went home and it was a school building. Mm. So that's, that's one of the things I'm grateful for, for that mm. because it, um, it brought that, sign, that sense of music as well, because mm. not from the traditional church with organs. We had electrical or, um, um, music, um, instruments again. So if that's what you play, that's Curtis, what you said, that's what you listen to. Yes. Okay. Yes. So when I met your brothers, and I remember it was about early, late 70s, early 80s, probably, I think early, no, mid to, mid to mm. late 70s. Mm. Uh, we lived a street apart. We lived on George Street. You guys lived on Homer Street. Mm. And I went to see Glenn. We used to see him every night. And he said, I want you to listen to this. And he was playing this music. Never heard it before. I said, who's this woman singing? It was Chaka Khan. Couldn't believe it. <laughs> Couldn't believe it. And he said, this is the sound I want to play. And a little bit later, we heard of a group called the Brothers Johnson, bass mm. players. And again, Glenn introduced me to them. And I'm thinking to myself, there's something there, there's something there. Um, at that time, we were having conventions. And our convention season for our church started about January, okay. went through to April. Mm. And what used to happen, you had popular songs or popular choruses that were played in each district. So depending on when your district convention was, by the time these songs had got to your district convention, most people knew them and they were just ordinary. So by that time I began to play away from a local church and in conventions. I think I was playing in national conventions when I was about 14. Mm -hmm. National conventions. You'd have been 70. Yeah, yeah 70. definitely about 14. And um, I remember having a discussion with, um, I think it was me, Trevor and, and Glenn at the time, 
because um, our convention was a bit late that year and they were saying, we've been hearing these choruses through the different conventions, so we need to try and do something different because it, like most musicians, when you're bored of a song, you're bored of it and you just, you don't have no feeling to it. So I remember hearing some tunes, I can't remember what they were, and something said, take the, take the rift from this and apply it to this chorus. And it just flipped it on the head. Mm. And then we started doing that. So when they came to the convention, because the convention, again, people came to hear the word of God, but people who were interested in music, they yeah, came to see what we do. Yes. So big competition was between District 1, which was the London area, and District, and District 4. four. So we'd goodness. hear what they're going to drop. So it depends on who came first. So yeah. we all, me, I felt like we needed to come with something because they know the chorus. So let's put a rhythm on it. Let's put a different riff to it. Let's put a different lick to it and just flip it. And so they knew that this came from Elvis and then now it was... <laughs> <laughs> and we crossed them. So we, we yeah. cross-pollinated mm. um, the worldly beats with the songs and it just rolled on from there. Mm. So it made it interesting and it was very impacting, I think, especially, especially for a lot of budding musicians because they just didn't... I mean, we are here... We hear the things on the radio, but we just never think about bringing them into the church because it was sacred music. But we brought it across and mm. it made it more interesting and certainly different. But the greatest days of my life was definitely playing with your brothers, Trevor and, and Glenn. Mm. Um, we formed Shiloh Band, which was a very good band as well. We, mm. My best days, my best church days was definitely with those two guys. Mm. And we were a threesome, a trio, a trio sorry. And... Um, I'm a fan of trios. You know, I love mm. the police, I love the jam. Something about trios. And when you have that relationship, like I said, they were my brothers, so we had this bond anyway. And then when it merged into this mm. musical bond, mm. it was time. It was time. Mm. Great days. Great days. So Les and I are at similar age. <laughs> so our journeys, he's was down the road of playing music. And because we're first generation, that's right. Um, you know, black, the UK. So we did a lot of firsts. Mm. So as he talked about the music, you know, for the younger generation, that was a first for them to play in conventions. So that's why they started playing so young, because of um, uh, you know the opportunity uh, was there. For myself, um, my mother having a local church, and one of the ways to raise funds was to have programs so you know you'd invite other churches to come around and my mother They're again like many concerts, aren't they? Well, yeah. well ahead of her time mm. but she'd have new testament brethren come you know reefer graham reefer lita mm. pastor graham her name was and um she again woman out of her time really mm. really engaged was, with young yeah, people loved old people loved mm. young people yes she did and for a small church, when she started with children, she'd literally mm. walk around the area and ask children who were playing in the street, couldn't do that now, you know, take me to your mum. Yeah. And that's what she'd do, take me to, where's your mum? And she'd go and say to them, oh, rather than be on the street, I'll have them for Sunday school. Mm. And that's how she started back mm. in the late 60s, maybe mm. 67, 68. Mm. And then the church in 1971 was organised with eight members. Um, she died in 1988 and there were nearly 100 members mm, that's right um and half of the church 50 percent of the young church people. young people yeah so she she attracted not all of them were from church families mm. so you know usually it's like you know you come to church with your parents and and then you become part of the church well my mom won young people so we had um you know quite a wealth of um of young people in our local church so anyway going back to the program so with programs you have a choir that would sing so we had like a you know the older people and then because, you know, you had to be part of the choir. So we'd be singing with the, the choir. Hymnals. Uh, uh, singing hymns or Negro spirituals. Mm, yes, as well. So we'd be taught. Mm. Sister Burton um, was our kind of choir mistress. And I remember her, you know, you have to stand with your hand on your hip, on your, your waistline, and point your finger when you were singing the Negro, Negro spirituals. spirituals. Mm. You know, brilliant. Highlighted but that. Um, but that, again, those are highlights. But there was a gap, you know, there was a, there was a, the need or a space for there to be, you know, young people. To be connected. Um, mm. Singing. So we'd sing the older songs. And then obviously in tandem came the Andre Crouches. And we wanted to be able to sing those kind of songs, you mm. know, a bit more up, upbeat. So I recall 
going to my mother sent me to the national sorry the general assembly of the church of god of prophecy in 1977 america wasn't it 1977 mm. my first year going to the um going to the general assembly and myself and Pat Womack, I remember it very distinctly, Pat Womack. That was in America, wasn't it? In America, That's right. sorry. Pat Womack, um, previously McCullough, so Bishop Theophilus McCullough, T.A. McCullough's daughter. So we were there that year. We were around maybe 16, 16 17 that year. And um, we heard this choir, um, Battle Creek Choir from yeah, Michigan. Michigan. Mm-hmm. And I tell you, the choir director, the, the, the call arrangement, you know, mm. like the big sound of, mm. of a choir blew us away. So we thought, wouldn't it be great if all the choirs around our district, in District 4, Birmingham, came together to make one choir? Mm. And, and that's how the District um, 4 mass choir came, was birthed really. It was very embryonic. So in 1977, we talked about it. Um, we had to persuade Brother McCullough, Pastor McCullough, who was the district overseer, persuade him to let us, you know, have this choir. Because he said, well, we've got a choir already. But it was like the older people. And we had to sing like, you know, the hymns and things, mm. which we loved. And don't, forget, don't get me wrong, yeah. we loved the hymns. But, you know, singing, earthly fame may never be my lot to hold, was very different to Genesis, 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 Genesis. So, you know, so, so we, we, we were given our little squeeze, but it didn't happen until the, the, the kind of early 80s, really, 84, 85, it didn't really happen until then. But my local church choir, so I'll talk a bit about Brass Choir in a little while, but my local church choir now, um, we moved from programmes to having concerts. My mother saw that we could raise even more funds if we charged people at the door. Because when you had programmes, you didn't charge people at the door. They'd come in and then they'd boost. So it would be like, you know, 10, you know, 10 pence this person to sing, five pence that person don't sing, one pound don't say nothing, sit down. You know, and the night would string out and all, the, and all of the items you couldn't get through because of this kind of, you know, bidding backward and forward. So we, um, we had a, a concert and uh, to obviously attract not just the church family, but people Community. outside of church, so neighbours and things Community like that. Came. You needed to have, you know, a choir that sounded like something sensible. So we, in our local church, we didn't have any musicians. We had, like, my, little, my brother, Lenny, would play the guitar. Um, uh, but, you know, he wasn't kind of skilled. He played, but he wasn't skilled. And, uh, and Jerry Cohen that would play the guitar as well. But so for a concert where you're inviting, you know, quite a big crowd, we needed musicians. In comes Trevor. Trevor, and um, who was head of the Shiloh Band, and let us kind of beautifully describe how they came about. And um, I became friends with Trevor when we used to go on the coach to Minister's Convention. So anyway, we, you know, he bought me a, a sausage roll, I think. Mm. I think it was a sausage roll at a service station. And he was there. And, never looked um, back. You and, never you know, looked back. And, 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 yeah, you and never we got chatting. And, and there's a story behind that, you know. I haven't got time to go into it now. But, but back then, if boys talked to girls, oh, my gosh, it was a big deal. Anyway, someone went to tell my mum that some boy took me out to eat. It was Trevor buying me a sausage roll. Anyway. But, um, <laughs> but anyway, that was beside the point. But um, so, so, so Trevor graciously said he'd come and play for my choir. So uh, the young people at my church, we'd learn the songs, again, choir songs. So at the time, it would either have been Walter Hawkins, a choral arrangement by Walter Hawkins. It would have been something that Andre Crouch might have sung, one of his songs, um, or, you know, f from, from that oh, yeah. era. And um, so we'd learn the songs first. We'd get the pitch from the, the, the tape that we'd listen to. And then Trevor would learn the music, he and the Shiloh Band, Glenn, Trevor and um, Les. Uh, and then Ber Beris came a bit later, later on, on uh, a bit later mm. on down the line as percussionist. And then we'd come on a Sunday, maybe a, a six weeks or so before the convention, uh, sorry, the before concert. the concert, mm. we'd come together, the, the, the music and the voices, and then work it out, because obviously the musicians would have played at 
you know, in a particular way. We would have sung it a particular way and then we'd work it out. But in the end, there was a marriage. And it was, um, it was awesome just having that live sound, the live band. Mm. Uh, and then when we went, uh, we started off obviously having the concerts in, in the, the church hall because we were at, um, we were at um, Old Fallings Lane, Refor United Reformed Church in Wolverhampton. And uh, because as a choir, we were getting more proficient because the music was complementing what we were doing. Then my mother, again, who was out of her time, pushed the boundaries. So a little church, backwaters in Wolverhampton, we had a concert at the Wolfen. Uh, town hall. Yeah, I remember that. And uh, Trevor and you know and the band came to play, and I recall um, Les couldn't play for one of the concerts that we did, and Glenn, sorry Ray, had to be the drummer for us, mm. but he had to come to practices anyway. Mm. Um, had no choice. The, the, the brothers had no choice but to take him because mm -hmm. Sister Prince, their mum, mm. Francis Prince, wouldn't yes. allow Trevor and Glenn to go without taking uh, Ray with them. And we had awesome, awesome concerts, spirit filled, mm. the anointing was there, yeah. um, the people beg for more, mm. and we'd always leave them wanting more. That was our trick. You always finish on a high note, knowing that people want to come back to hear mm. you next mm. year. And obviously in between, we'd sing at other people's concerts and so on. Mm. But annually, we'd have our own mm. uh, concerts. So yeah. we became proficient and clearly... You can imagine this being replicated at each of the churches mm. around Dudley, the, the, the region, Dudley, Dudley True Vine, Small Heath, oh, amazing and so forth. Mm. And then the, the choirs, and at, what was born out of the choirs was then was groups. Mm. And then we'd sing Clark sister songs or Barrett sister songs. So that, um, you know, as, as, as uh, smaller chorales, uh, we again began to develop our skills. And out of that came True Vine, as mm. uh, Les was saying. In, in Dudley, and so on. Uh, and then all of those choirs, when Pastor Matt gave us the green light, came together as a mass choir, the Birmingham Mass Choir, Church of God of Prophecy. Mm. And um, we had, no, no, the, at, at our peak... Five? At our peak, we were, we were maybe 420. Mm. At our peak, we had 420 members of the mass choir. And um, we sang at places like the Birmingham Town Hall, we sang on TV, we sang in America, we sang in the Bahamas, mm. we were recorded, uh, you know, live um, in, in America when we, we sang uh, there. So it, it, it built um, fantastic friendships, mm. as you can well imagine, when we had rehearsals and we were very disciplined in our rehearsal time. Trevor played for the Mass Choir at one point, he played with Josh and so forth, uh, um, and Vindel for the Mass Choir. And we would stretch our capabilities, stretch mm. our voices. We didn't um, stick to songs that were kind of out there. We'd look for people like the, the New Jersey Mass, uh, Timothy Wright, Thomas Whitfield, mm. the Tommies, you know, James Thompson and the Community Choir. Uh, we'd stick all of their materials. And we wouldn't find the ones that were commonly known. So when we had our concerts in the Town Hall in Birmingham, We'd sing songs like TikTok. Um, I mentioned Genesis. Uh, we'd do old, old favourites, or we'd get some hymns and rearrange them mm -hmm. so that um, we'd put a, our own spin on uh, material or write our own stuff. Aberdeen Street Youth Choir used to do that, write their own material and so forth. So we, we had a phenomenal experience. We'd have lead singers. Some of the things that, um, you know, I didn't consider myself a singer per se, but, uh, you know, I'd lead some of the songs or direct uh, uh, the Mass Choir along with Joy, um, the late Lorna Watson Simmons, uh, professionally known as Joy. And Hazel. And uh, her sister Hazel, who would sing uh, the lead in some of those songs. So uh, all in all, um, and again, I, don't, I want to make sure I capture this as well. We weren't insular. Although there were um, possibly issues... Um, particularly, I don't denominational know, denominational boundaries. You know, denominational boundaries going up through the maybe the seventies. In the sixties, it wasn't like that, but towards the kind of eighties, um, there, there, there was um, this sort of you know apostolic can't mix with prophecy and so forth. As a as a age, you know, our young people, we challenge those boundaries. So 
if Highgate New Testament was having a concert, we'd go and sing for them, or we'd invite Highgate to come and sing, you know what I mean, with us. So we tried to break down a lot of those uh, divides and barriers uh, and so forth, and um, had a platform, we, we used to call it the circuit. So we'd be singing on the circuit with Dave Copeland, uh, you know, back in the day, the Highgate Choir, New Testament Choir, um, and uh, a lot of the, the you know, the, the, the mass choir singers now, a lot of them went on to do great things. Um, BV, uh, uh, Sister Brown's daughters, Gloria yeah. Brown's daughters, yeah. and go on, uh, you know, be uh, backing yeah. vocalists for mm. uh, artists and so on. And our musicians, again, would go and do the same, or their children. So I remember Gareth Brown, him going to play drums for someone. And we fostered youth. So we'd have young people coming in and playing, or, you know, they joined the mass choir at 12, 13. Uh, and so forth. So again, it was an avenue for us to have fellowship and fun mm. and so on and be competitive. So the Birmingham Mass Choir would be competitive with the London Mass Choir. So that when we when we had our conventions, you know, we'd, we'd be at the back and watch the London Choir sing. And we'd go, we're coming on next, you know, make sure, <laughs> you know, make sure. Um, and Joy would have us drill, we'd drill with our vocal warm-ups and so on, and then we'd go and smash it. The Lord was in there as well somewhere, praise you, Jesus. But it was very much about demonstrating our talents and our ability uh, with our singing, yeah, so. A lot there. Did uh, I go on too much? No, 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 because I mean, there's, there's enough for me, there's <laughs> yeah, enough for Roger. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the thing is, because I uh, work with Karen Gibson, Oh, oh you know, Kat. So, yeah. so, uh, and she, she was she, there with London. She's, she's, yeah, she's, so, London. she's really PC in it. Yeah. yeah. So I explained to her that there's an issue with Birmingham and London. As far as I know. Yes, she, was was. <laughs> she was too young. She was too young. They wouldn't have known then. <laughs> she they was too young. She was too young. She, she was too young. Oh, God. They no. and, and, and our district... Oh, is it still recording? <laughs> <laughs> our, but, but our, you cut this bit out. But our district, our district overseers... Yeah. Hype that up. Oh, right. I don't. Mm. So you had TA Yo, saying we had the dish, best, yeah, yeah. we were the best yeah. choir, the best musicians, the best offerings, the best this, that, the other. So after, you know, after um, like London would sing, and then Pastor would get up and say, Yeah, I was saying, Oh, praise. He said, And now we are going to be hearing from all the most fantastic, and he built us up. And then when we finished, his head was like this big. There was definitely a... Yeah, yeah, yeah. he could definitely back it because, you know, we, we did have the Josh McCullers who played, you know, the Vindels, the Lesburns. You know, we, we definitely had it. Yeah, definitely had it. I've got two more, two more questions. From the, what, the first one is, what, did the, what was the impact of the week? Probably not. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, definitely. Like, that's a question. What do these songs, all the songs that I'm covering and stuff mm. that you grew up mm. with, oh, yes. what do they mean to you? Oh, God, yes. So Definitely. Mm. That's that yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's, I think for me, well, similar to yourselves, um, we, were, we were sheltered from a lot of the stuff that our parents really. Yes, experience. Um, experience. They didn't talk a lot about it, but I know you, you follow on to understand um, the racism that they suffered when they went into um, the workplace. Um, we had a touch of it, definitely, and because of where we lived sometimes. And I remember um, when we went to our secondary school, um, we all wanted to go to Queensbridge. Mm. That's where all the ragamuffins went. And my mum said, oh, no, I'm not going there. And she went and found a predominantly white school. And when we got there, there was just that handful of black people. And the racism was starting, and we had to hold our ground. And I think for me, when I really got to understand it, was um, when I became a missionary, and they sent me to France in the early 80s. And I saw racism in its height out there mm. in France. Mm. And I remember sitting on a bus one day and this woman was looking at me, she did this. And um, I knew what she was thinking. And I just had a thought, this must have been what it was like when Your our parents, parents came. Because mm. they, they, they shielded us from a lot. 
um, my experience of racism when I was about direct racism when I was about five or six years old and I went to the neighboring street to call my friend who was knocking on my door and obviously they weren't in so I didn't know that so I was knocking and the neighbor who was an English lady heard me knocking and she said go back to where you come from Blackie so I was just in shock and I'm walking down the street I'm about five or six years old and I'm trying to convince myself that she meant go back to your street where you come from, which was George Street, the next street down. And I'm thinking to myself, no, she didn't mean that. She didn't mean that. And I knew that was a racist onslaught. And as I said earlier on, you know, um, how we combated that is that we were a community by ourselves. The church was a community, community yes, definitely. by ourselves. Definitely. And we couldn't change society there and then, but we came amongst our own and we prayed and we sung the songs Song of Zion. Mm. because tomorrow was going to school and we're going to have it at school or mm. tomorrow name work and they were going to have it at work. So we came and people wept and they wept in the altars and the songs, the old songs, the Negro spirituals and the hymns, I must have the Saviour with, with me, me yes. for I dare not walk alone. Yes, and guide me all that great Yeah, Jehovah and so you had to me. sing these songs and sometimes when, you, when your parents would talk a little bit about it, they said how when the racist onslaught were coming on, they had to quote the songs to themselves, just like uh, the slaves did mm -hmm. back in the day of slavery when they're picking the cotton, they sung the spirituals to get through that day. Mm. And I imagine many of our parents did that. Mm. And again, from a musical standpoint, as we said before, that's what gave rise to the, especially the, the electrical instrument, electronic in, in, instruments. They came because we couldn't go, they wouldn't allow us to, to mm. worship. So we said, okay, since we can't worship, can we hire your back hall? Nope. And thank God for the schools and the caretakers. And I think every, every church that was worshiping the school had the same caretaker, the one with the dog. And the pipe, and the pipe, and the pipe. And he'd flick the lights when it was time. That time the Holy Spirit was there, people were getting saved. Yeah. And he'd just come in with his dog and he starts. So, and, and that's what prompted <clears throat> um, the congregations to move out of school halls and buy their church buildings. Had to. Had because to. they were being forced out mm, of the, yeah, the, 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 the height of services. In the height of services. And, yeah. and it's, I guess, again, from a very English perspective, you know, what they call a lengthy service or something like 45 minutes to an hour. And those days, we it's went to church twice. Hour. We went at, at 11, we came home at 2, and back in those days, Six, yeah. no, sorry. We went in at four o'clock in the afternoon mm. for Sunday school. Yeah. And four till six was Sunday school. And then, and then evening, evening service. service was 6 p.m. till 10. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. You get the thought? That's right. Very much so. Very much so. So it mm. made us and it didn't kill us. Mm. And it's as modern as we get. When things get serious for us, we go back to our roots. And remember. And we sing the guide, you know. Yes. Our great Jehovah, yeah. lead me through this barren land. Yes, definitely. What's one of your favourite songs? Oh. Hymns? Yeah, yeah. I like all of them. I think um, it's a very good one. I'll come back to you on that one because there's yeah, so I, many. Yeah, I know my favourite. I love yeah. most of them. I, I, like, I like all the hymnals. Oh, impact yeah. of the Windrush. What um, do these songs mean? Mm. We were, um, my first few years, I, I recall, as a child, a very small child, we were itinerant. I say itinerant because we were like, you know, like the children of Israel, we had no dwelling place. Mm. So we were in one room, we lived in one room in somebody else's house. And, uh, you know, we'd move around again because my father had not planned to stay, so I didn't want to buy a house. And um, my mother was insisting that, you know, the children are growing up, we can't live like this, the three kids. So she got a council house, 50 Millington Road, was our first family home. And we were one of two black families on the street. Um, my experience is slightly different. I know that racism clearly was an issue, but um, the neighbours that we had were very welcoming and treated us really, really well. So I can't say that I directly experienced, you know, you know blatant racism. Um, I think not until I went to secondary school, I would have thought. Secondary school, where I know I had to 
uh, you know, when you're walking to school, you'd get uh, uh, jibes, mm. jibes and things mm. from the boys, because we, I went to an all-girls school, and the boys would, you know, pick, pick on you, but... Um, but again, you had a, a sense of self, of being black in a, a predominantly white environment. You, you were aware of that. But I think because back then we met so frequently as a black community, because we had, as Les was saying, practically all day Sunday, you were in church. Mm. Saturday, you were either at a concert or a program. Um, in the week, you were at prayer, prayer meeting. meetings. Uh, so, you, you know, you're always around, uh, you know, black people. So that sense of self and knowing who you were, I, I can't, I think apart from when I might have, I was very, very little, maybe about six or seven, I remember, I used to put a half slip over my head, you know, and do this. Hmm. I wanted long hair, you know, and I'd do this. Probably that was the nearest I'd get to saying, you know, the, mm -hmm. the kind of white community was infecting me. Um, but... Um, but knowing, knowing who I was, I think, kind of centred me and my friendship group. So I didn't need, like, you know, some folks that go to school or as I got older and went to work and work becomes your community. So they go out after work and so on. I didn't need that. Mm. Um, so Church was everything. It, well, church was. It was your life. It, it was church your life 24-7. And then when they got to the friends, camping ministry mm. where, you know, you met your friends in the summer. Oh, my gosh. So, you know, there were, there were timelines in the calendar that, that kind of, you had to look forward to the conventions in the spring, then the... Um, youth conventions. Then the youth conventions, then the, conven you know, the main convention in July, and then all the camps throughout the summer, and then winter retreat, mm. and then the, the national secretaries rallies in the autumn. So, so throughout the whole year... Something going. There was some, you know, stuff to. going on, which was mm. fantastic. Mm. My community. daughter always says, Mum, you know, I wish we had... All those. You know, what you had. Although... On the one hand, you could say it was a challenging time with poverty and for some, and the, the, the kind of ad out racism, but there was a, a lot of unity and, mm. and, and togetherness. We did come together. So we, um, like I say, you know, the, the impact, certainly for my father, he was always wanting to go back to Jamaica, didn't want to stay in England, I think because of racism, mm. I reckon. He didn't actually say it, but I reckon that was mm. the reason why. They handled when, themselves when, well. Yeah, they really did. They did. They, they were very, very, they very dignified. Us. They protected very dignified. us. They really protected us. And like when us. you when you have somebody that was skilled, mm. coming from a, a skilled work background, coming to this country, and being told you can't have that skilled job, you've got to go and work in a factory. You know what I mean? It it, it kind of the two rubbed. But I had very progressive parents. I remember at school when um, I was taking my exams. I was quite. I was very bright, bright academically. And um, I wanted to go on to college and, and so forth. And um, I remember the, the teacher saying to me, the commerce teacher saying to me, um, oh, you can leave school with the qualifications that you've got and get a job anywhere. I said, but I don't want to do that. I want to go to college. You don't have to go to college. I went and told my mother this. Well, anyway, my mother went straight up to the school and uh, she didn't talk to the teacher. She asked for the head of year, Mr Good, his name was. And she said, how dare you? How dare you? You tell my daughter what she can and cannot do. If she wanted to go and become the prime minister of this country, she could do that because, you know, so you, you had, you know, you, you, you had instilled in you. And my mother used to say, there's no such word as can't. Don't let anybody put a ceiling on you. Whatever your ability is, you can maximise. That's why I went on to, you know, get my MBA as a, as a distinction because I always had them in the back of my mind. My mother... You know, and my dad as well, to some degree, but you know, pushing this whole thing about education. So, as um, and my profession when I, you know, sort of settled on a profession was in social work, and it was always a challenge for me when you placed black children in white families. One of the things I used to say to the parent, white foster parent is that you know you need to be able to what you can't do what a black parent can do, which is teach their children how to survive in a white community. Mm. You know, you can love a child, but you have to teach them skills. Our parents taught us the skills to hold our head up high, be confident uh, in our ability, in what we were able to do. That's why my brother at 17, when he got the electrician qualification, by the time he was in his early 20s, he had his own business. Because, you, you know, you were kind of pushed to not work for somebody else. You do you. Do you. Um, so, yes, yeah, so it, it did have impact early on. But I think it strengthened me and strengthened my resolve to be the best, be the best that I could. 
um, because you had to be to outdo, you know what I mean, your counterpart. The church part. gave you value. Yes. Gave you purpose. It gave you identity. Yes. That was and, very important. And yeah, Not having identity would have been such right, a struggle. And, 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 and giftings as well. And you think something simple like um, public speaking. Yes. It's natural to us in the church. Natural to us. I mean, I, I preach people first... of other cultures are thinking, how do you talk like that? And you've got no script. Because we used to it from, from children, from children. testifying yes. at church. So right. the skills yeah. that we have learned in the church have just been amazing. Amazing. But I love, this, I love the Gospels. I love um, the hymns. You know, whether it's uh, Irie D. Sankey, um, Stir Souling, the Banner Hymn, and then the Hymns of Glorious Praise. I love them all. I love them all. I say I, I, I preached my first sermon when I was 12 years old. So again, you know, being in, in the pulpit. So when we had inter things like interviews, no you sail through interviews no because you were able to confidently speak. speak if you had to do a presentation. Mm -hmm. They'd go, oh, my God. And you said, I'd, I'd volunteer, so I'll do it because we were used to public speaking. And also if you were from a small church, you had no choice. Well, yes, because you, you had to preach, you had to teach. So the teaching skills you, you developed, everything. you know, you, you did it all. Really. God is good. My favourite song and uh, the story with this one, my mother died in 1988. Uh, I was 29 years of age. She died the 1st of April. And um, she loved to sing. She was a singer. And um, she had lots of favourite songs, but... The song that kept me sane when she passed unexpectedly was on Christ's solid rock. Mm. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Oh, I dare not trust the deep. sweetest frame, but only lean on Jesus', Jesus name. Oh, on Christ, Christ the, sun, the solid rock I stand. stand. All of the sound, groundest mm. sinking sand. Mm. And so I, I sang that. Um, not at her funeral, but a few weeks later, I was asked to preach, and I sang that before I preached, mm. and um, it has stuck with me always. Mm. That's my favourite song. Yeah, it's just just loving it, you know. And I think um, from a musician's perspective, for me, it was always about how can I cross pollinate. So it's a it's a hymn that we've been singing. How can we flip it and make it more popular and put a beat to it, a jazz beat or a funk beat? Just just to turn it around. Just to turn. Yeah, I think we were at, um, was it uh, but No, we're at somewhere, it was a balcony. I mean, we were on a balcony somewhere, if I remember rightly. And I saw you. And um, town hall. I can't remember, it was somewhere. Because he started, he was playing, but he was playing. He, he was, was playing somewhere, town but hall. I remember I had, it was a kit, it was this, the stick bag and everything. Yes. Because I knew it was that time when I felt the call to go on to mission, so I knew that I was in transition, and when I knew that something had happened, Pick up the Bible, I had to move sticks. on and go on and become a missionary, which I was doing up for 12 and a half years in Europe and Africa, still working in France now, and I knew it was the end of an era. And the thing about um, time and seasons, mm. recognise when your season's up. up and move on. Recognise, like a man walking around here or a woman walking around here in a bikini in the winter, Something wrong, something yeah. wrong, you know? But it's fine if she was in Jamaica on the beach, we wouldn't be looking at her strange. And it's reckoned that I knew my seasons was up. And um, I remember sitting down thinking, it's time now. And you're the person that came to mind. So I remember packing up all my stuff. I remember my sister was saying, what are you doing? I said, I'm packing it all. Well, what are you going to do with it? I said, I know what to do with it. And um, I don't even know if you were there, you were coming there. I don't know if I had the communication with you that night. You called me to <clears throat> Oh, yes, that other one as well. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. there was one where I gave you some sticks yeah, somewhere. Stick yeah, I remember that, definitely. Yeah, yeah. 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 He loved his jump kit so much. He used to take pictures with his jump kit. The national question. Yeah, he used, to, he used to stack them from the bass drum, you know, the bass drum. Right the way up to the... Yeah, and take pictures mm -hmm. next to his drum. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hey? You got any of those pictures? Yes. I've got one. I've got a picture. You've got a picture of that where, one. You know, it used to be on your deeper. wall. Yeah. I've got that one. I've got one somewhere where I stack them all outside. Uh, outside the house on George Street. Yeah. And I think it's the thing is about whatever you do, you, it's about mastering your mm -hmm. instruments. You're a musician, you understand the same thing. And sometimes you're looking for a sound. You, you understand your instrument. You and the instrumental one. 
and then you're looking for a sound. I think we spoke about this before, about um, we were at practice one night and um, your brother Trevor was chewing his guitar and I bought a new kit and I was trying to get used to it, trying to understand the sounds because when you're used to like a three piece and you go to something like an eight, 10 piece kit, you gotta know the sounds and try to understand the sound. And um, Trevor was tuning his guitar and I thought, that sounds interesting. And I said, play that again. And he was doing it. And I started tuning my drums, each drum, to the sound of each string of the guitar. Don't know why. Some kind of madness took me that day. Mm. But A lot of it was intuitive. <clears throat> yeah, and every we time we, we, we moved we somewhere. Taught, we weren't taught these you, things. You know, you don't. You just, it just seemed yeah. right to me, because as you know yourself intuitive. as a musician, mm. when you get in somewhere, um, the first thing you do, put your kit up or you put your um, guitars up and you start tuning guitar. And I started doing the same thing, looking for a sound and, mm. and you, you just stop. So it was there, but, um, you know, God rest his soul, Trevor was just truly amazing. So yeah, really three was. great influences for me, Trevor Prince, definitely. Um, Ozzy Williams, Williams, still in America now. And my childhood best friend, Wayne Williams, who mm. started me on this musical journey. Mm. I love the music and still mm. now. Mm. And um, we... Yeah. Uh, it's about understanding we were among great people, great people. Yes. And it's only when they've gone we realise or we step into the role of leadership. You look back and think, how on earth did they do? Your mom, Frances yeah. Prince, unbelievable woman. I did unbelievable do it. woman. But they did. And um, what she believed, she held her ground, she held her faith, and she mm. went all the way. And we are uh, indebted to them. And even when we bury them with tears in our eyes, we still owe them and yeah. God bless them. We will remember. And we will never forget them. We and thank you for your them. time. My, my mother, as I mentioned her, Pastor Reefa Graham, um, understood the value of having good musicians because we didn't have any in our local church. And so when Trevor and the Shiloh Band came to play for us, my mother insisted. Well, well no, when they came to rehearsals, <clears throat> she'd, she'd cook fried chicken. And she'd, she'd send food for them. So after the rehearsal, I mean, you know, they'd lick their lips. They'd probably try and eat it before. Because mum would say, make sure Trevor eat, you know, make sure Trevor mm -hmm. eat. And she'd cook and make sure they eat. And um, then when, obviously, we started to have more coming in because we had a, a larger arena, okay. mm -hmm. my mum would give a portion of the money that was raised to the, to the band. So I think she might have been one of the earlier people uh, that most definitely. paid musicians for their, their time. But that, and Trevor didn't ask for it. No. He didn't kind of, you know, nowadays they give you the, you know, Disrespect. we're not coming unless yeah. you, pay, you can pay mm. this. Yeah. And she uh, called it a love offering. Mm. But she'd, she'd make sure she took a, good, a portion of the offering. I think at one time it was like a hundred pounds, something like that. Mm, but she'd put, put that in an envelope mm. and give it to, uh, to Trevor. But it started off with her cooking food. And then once we started to get more money coming in, she took a portion of the takings yeah. and gave it to the band. The going rate at the time mm. was um, a ginger beer. And a patty. And a patty. And we went to London one time. <laughs> We'd hired a van, hired speakers, everything the lot. We went to London, did the concert. And when we came by, the lady gave us two party and a ginger beer. And she said, you're lucky, you get two. Not, not realising you'd, you'd, you'd had to spend your money to get the equipment. You're lucky, you get two, mate. <laughs> OK? There you go. So my, my mum was a bit more advanced. It's just, we, <laughs> we understood, again, <laughs> when you love something, you don't charge. That's right. And we understood. It. And the passion. It's just to see, you know, the, the, the churches, because, again, we were doing our bit to build the churches because mm. people came to these concerts and most of the concerts were named in aid of building, building, yeah, funds. No building funds. So when I see a buildings. lot of the churches that have been, we travelled around the country, and when I see a lot of these churches like Bristol, Tudor Road, Bristol, we went down there, did concerts down there. And I've done a lot of churches I go to and I remember coming there and it's either going there for like conventions or we're going down there to do a concert. And if you were a popular band, you're always cool. Yeah. They'd put you on. And the thing they used to do as well, they used to put your name down on the flyers before even asking us because they knew that if we were going to be there, they're coming. People, people and when come. they cut onto that, that was the one. That was the one. And, but again, we did it as unto the Lord and yes, God yes. rest 
your, your brother's yeah. soul. May yeah. he rest in peace. He was just phenomenal. I miss him every day. And as I said before, it was yeah. the greatest era in my life, apart from going on mission. But in my formative years in church, music was everything. It still is. Still is. And, and that you know, and that was a way of raising raising money for the buildings. You know, mm -hmm. concerts. We did it. We did it. Concerts. So it. so when we got to places like town hall and had mass choir concert, mm -hmm. where and we would fill Birmingham town hall, mm -hmm. fill it completely. No problem. Um, and you know, and so the 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 mantra for us was excellence. What we did, the practice was excellence. The the musicians had to be. You know, had to to do what they were doing with excellence. No, we had to. We excellence. train our voices. No, mm. now a lot of we weren't classically, classically trained, trained. No. or anything. When we were learning songs, mm. we'd listen to a tape or a record, mm. and we'd pick out the parts, and then we'd have section leaders. Some would teach the alto section. Some would teach the soprano. Would teach the 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 bass and the tenor section, and and that's how we we'd do it all by our ear. And obviously later on, you know, but I think all throughout the whole of the choir, mm. my, time, my time with the Birmingham Mass Choir, um, Church of Prophecy Birmingham Mass Choir, we learnt the songs by ear. Mm. We learnt the songs by ear. Yeah. And, 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 if you, and if you hear, and, and you know, it's a shame we haven't got any, but if you hear the, the original version and our version, I mean, we tweak it maybe, you know, you'd probably, you probably want to buy depends. our version because... We we blow it out the water all the time. I think the thing is ultimately the, mm. the great joy about playing in church, live music. Live music. And you know you're Beautiful. a musician yourself. There's nothing better like than live, live music. Live music. Think music. of the conventions where you're playing one song for twenty minutes straight. You imagine playing a song and a chorus for twenty minutes straight, and you've got to hold down that beat for yeah. twenty minutes. And the power of the Holy Spirit goes down and they're just singing on, the people are dancing in the aisles and marching around the building. And you've got to lock it down all when you're tired. And there's a lady named Sister Flary and she felt it once and she's going like this saying, keep it going on me, I'm tired, <laughs> tired, tired. And she said, keep us going, keep mm. us going. And people gave their hearts to the Lord. People were filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came down. And touch lives. People received a calling into ministry. Churches were birthed, and people got excited about getting on and doing the work. Mm. And uh, I think um, a lot of musicians are the unsung heroes in churches. Mm. You know, and I think the, the, especially the '80s era when our generation were of an age where we didn't have to go to church because we were like 18, 19. We could do what we want, and we did go. it came at the right time to keep the people together, keep the young people together, because they were interested. And I remember a few people we were talking to, and they said, uh, I'm clubbing it, man. And one guy said, I heard that beat in a club last night. And he couldn't get his head on, because he said, I heard that. Were you playing something? No, no, no. And I said, well, I don't know what you're talking about. But um, he said, yeah, I know, I know, I know. And they couldn't, they couldn't understand it. They couldn't understand it. They thought the two didn't, the twain didn't meet. And it was there, it made it interesting, people started coming. We had a thing called Minister's Retreat, or Minister's Convention, I'll close out with this. And um, it was predominantly for ministers, right? And prior to that, we had the camping uh, ministry and everybody met each other at camp. And then following that would be the Minister's Convention, which was only for ministers. Ministers couldn't get in. The ministers couldn't get in. It's the young people. <laughs> Place, they because get because it was somewhere to go and meet your friends. Meet your friends, mm. and it's just everything. But it's um, the word of God, obviously, um, the hymnals, and we celebrate them. And it's everything. You, you, you take what you have from your tradition, and you make it modern. You make it relevant to today. It's a bit like one one generation is singing, the other generation is rapping, same message, just a different style. And we just got to keep it and treasure it. And God bless you for what you're doing, yes. what you're recording. Applaud you and, for that. And um, I pray that it will be in the archives. Um, our biggest challenge for me, I think now, is we must be mindful to document these things. Because I think the worst thing could happen is for you to have your grandchild but, say uh, to you, tell me about grandma. Mm, and you say, I don't know. I can't remember. I don't know. We've been robbed of our history through slavery. And we have to embrace and preserve that which is tangible. It's a bit like we know we can strongly go back to the Caribbean 
but from the Caribbean to Africa, only one or two can do that. So that which we know about, which is the Caribbean and, and, and British England. life, we have to lock it down. And I applaud you guys for documenting it mm. because it's necessary. Yeah. In this you. time. Yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's, yeah, it's <coughs>